Welcome back to the Donahue Group. We're having a good time here talking about the great issues of the day, at least as uh, relates to the, uh, the, the city, local politics, and the state. Um, I am sitting with Cal Potter, Tom Paneski, Ken Risto, and may I just say for the audience as a whole, who don't seem to really have a, a fine enough appreciation for the pearls that I'm wearing today, and it, it hurts, but <clears throat> that's okay. You know, life does go on, and, and we'll continue to talk, so. The pearls uh, are hurting you? <laughs> is that what you're saying? Your lack of sensitivity uh. to this issue is, is, is troubling, <clears throat> but in any event, let's get on to the real news and talk about um, uh, all sorts of things going on at the state level. Um, we discussed in our last program talking about a little bit about local uh, issues as relates to the school district, the police liaison officers, school, school reading scores and so forth. A big deal in, in um, Florence County, far away in the northeast part of the state, um, they're going to close their school district. Now we have 72 counties in the state. We have well over 400 school districts. 426. 426, I was going to say 416. 426 school districts. Now, it appears, 425 school districts. This hasn't happened for 15 years. Cal, you're a former DPI person. What's your, what's your take on this? Well, this is a, this is a major occurrence because uh, once the school board votes to dissolve, the state comes in and now has to uh, set up a special committee that involves the state superintendent to try to work out the dissolution of a county, literally, and divide it amongst the adjoining school districts, which is something that has not happened in a long time. And it reflects, I think, uh, the very inflexible revenue caps that we have in this state uh, that don't reflect uh, the needs of districts that have very little economic activity or growth and districts that have declining enrollment. You're talking about a district in Florence County with uh, less than 700 kids. Uh, it's a small district but yet uh, it's a large district, and so you're gonna deal with uh, a situation of busing kids, uh, appropriation of monies for debt that they incurred on buildings, uh, where the buildings are going to be moved to, and how far these kids will have to, to go if indeed uh, they are uh, transferred into a new district. And Florence, I think, got crunched <clears throat> not only with declining enrollments, so school districts now get money per student on a three-year average, um, but high property taxes, because if, at least for vacationers, Florence yeah. County can be a nice place to go to. Mm -hmm. So you have property taxes rising, which is happening all over the northern part of the state. Well, it's happening, or not property taxes, property values. And so in that state formula, it's a double crunch, and, and they're kind of out of luck. Uh, I haven't been follow, uh, following the process other than just what I read a couple days ago. But uh, I gather they had three referendums over the course of time because they were always spending more than they could get in revenue, and uh, they were having to cut programs. To, or they always had more costs than they had revenue, so they had to cut programs. And this was like in the third, third time around, they had to cut <coughs> programs. And they had referenda before, and the people in the community uh, voted down the referenda. Uh, Last one was only by... One percent. I think it was twenty-one so it was votes. Close. It was yeah. very close. Yes. But but it comes down to uh, and then there are five school districts surrounding the area. That's what I I read. You probably have a better sense of what what Florence is. And so these the students who had to bus long ways to Florence, the school, now have will be oh. divvied up in bus. So people are making a decision for their children. <laughs> Does <laughs> Kelvin do you can answer this question? Uh, who makes the ultimate determination then of what parcels of, if this continues to go down, which parcels go to which school districts? There is a, there's a committee that's set up by the state superintendent okay. that uh, does the actual dividing, and I would presume they'll just bring in the, the uh, superintendents and the school board members from the adjoining districts and said let's do some group think here as to what's logistically uh, good and what, uh, right. and, and particularly probably debt. Uh, you might have a new school in, uh, in mm -hmm. one area that needs to be mm. put in another, who's going to share that debt? And those are the type of questions that are very difficult questions. This is not something that's easily done. And so uh, usually what happens is a district decides to merge with an adjoining district. Oh, yeah, and in yeah. that way, there's sort of an amicable agreement when you start 
divvying up a whole county between five adjoining districts, mm -hmm. that starts to get in, into, uh, uh, everybody sits down and says, well, now if I get all this equal as eva evaluation and this number of students, what happens to my state aid? And then they start taking positions, and so it gets to be a real hairy yeah. situation. That's where I was headed with my question, yeah. is the, it's the politics of that. It's going to be very difficult, that. yes. Yeah. Well, I'll play devil's advocate. Suppose I'm a, a family member and I have kids in the Florence district, but I'm closer to another district which uh, seems to have a better school, and I'd like to send my kids there. But I got to go to Florence. Well, actually, you, <laughs> you could. You could do but that. But I could do yeah, that. Under school there, choice, yeah. Yeah, there's okay. school choice provisions. That's what's kept so. Kohler alive, quite frankly. Yeah, I mean, the Kohler School District has Provide grown. Provide there's through. agreement amongst the uh, parties to. Yeah, oh, the, and there the has to be room. Yes. There has to be room for the, the in the case. receiving the school district. district. And so they would probably not support the referendum because they're going to send their kids to another district. So I don't yeah. want to spend for yeah. a school. Well, part of the thing. problem, though, is it's, it's, there's a mixture of different the politics. The funding formula, as far as I can tell, which is incredibly complex and I will never fully understand, but at least the basic skeleton I have down, it's a profoundly unfair system. And so you get, if, you're, if your population is declining, what we're doing with our funding formula is speeding up the decline of those communities by the fact that they can't afford their <coughs> schools anymore. And that has a profound, in my opinion, a profound ripple effect. And the Supreme Court has said the funding formula as it stands with the, with, with revenue caps, but also with that property valuation, um, where you came in at the revenue cap level back in 1996 depended so much on what your property tax structure was, which may or may not have been fair. And how frugal you were in the past. And how, yeah, exactly. You got punished for being frugal sure. under, the, right. under this existing system. Exactly. That's, that's the problem with <laughs> codifying in the legislative arena. Uh, uh, revenue cap formula that applies mm -hmm. to 426 school districts and keep it in place for 10 years. It's and just, it's, it yeah. should be revamped. It and really should, and it's so complex, and those yes. are difficult, difficult yeah. issues. There's no right or wrong answer, but uh, this is just not a, it's not a good thing. Now, do we need 426 school districts? Probably not. Probably not. Uh, it, but we have, you know, we've talked in prior programs, how many uh, local units of government do we have in, in, in Wisconsin? Yeah. Thousands. Yeah. And, do we and need all of those? No. No, not from a That's practical right. standpoint, but for that, the pride that you have in your school district and what it means to your community and so forth. Mm -hmm. those, are, those are big deals. The Plymouth School District, the Elkhart Lake School District are facing precisely these same kind of issues, and it's tough. Um, there are a number in the state. I think the yeah. CESA director, Bob Kellogg, from the northeast part of the state, has indicated he has several districts that are very similar to, right? to Florence, and that oh, sure. uh, this continues. Uh, more things will hit the fan in the near future. I was going to ask you, do you think Florence being the first might uh, well, be I, a catalyst for more? <laughs> yeah. it's, it's hard to say. You know, and Like you said, the people voted several times. Uh, Racine went through uh, a difficult time, and they the, the second time around, they passed a referendum. Mm -hmm. um, but again, Racine has a lot more tax base and a whole different situation uh, than northern Wisconsin. Well, and that we, we were going to talk a little bit today about the, um, about the uh, budget, where it stands now, passed by the Republican legislature, now goes to, to Governor Doyle with what we call the Vanna White veto. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, take a letter. <laughs> <laughs> Governor Doyle, give us a letter. Um, there's been some talk as to whether he should just veto the budget in its entirety and, and, and have folks just start over again. Um, those are fairly grisly kinds of things. But the um, Governor Doyle had requested, I believe, over $428 per student as an increase for, for revenue uh, purposes. Um, the Republicans are very proud, uh, you know, about how much they've increased uh, funding for schools, but in fact it's less than half of what the governor had proposed. Right. So it's, it's really a, it's a, a kind of a difficult issue. Segues into the University of Wisconsin system taking quite a hit, um, and of course having that little embarrassing <laughs> oh, yeah. um, glitch, I guess, is... Uh, an administrator to the tune of 191,000 a year, and not clear what kind of leave he was on and why he should have been. And bad timing, I guess, would be would be a, a fairly. Um, yeah. How do you fire somebody? That's sort of the issue, and you mm -hmm. don't. How do you let people go? I mean, that's the issue with the chancellor, uh, Chancellor Wiley. Yeah. Wiley. Mm -hmm. Wiley. Uh, even in the 
university, the local UW, local UW colleges, uh, you move people around. They don't fit in one position, or uh, you move them to another position, or I guess in the school, a school system, if you dis or in the city, city, if you discontinue a, a, the incinerator, what do you do with the people? You move them to another place. You just don't let them go. Yeah. Uh, well, that's not. I mean, there are layoffs, uh, you know, uh, but and absorb people through retirements. We've been pretty fortunate to manage <clears throat> in the district. Uh, a lot of that, a lot of the, the changes in staffing that we've had to do is we've never we've had a layoff in the Sheboygan Area School District for quite some time, uh, and it's pretty pretty much through you know retirements and attrition. Mm -hmm. But let me get us back just to the UW system, which is I, I'm a University of Wisconsin graduate. I was there as my parents would have told you for years and years and years <laughs> and years and lots of degrees, all of you know buy one wrap one fish. But um, it's a wonderful school system. Uh, it's an honor, I think, to this state. It, it well, 26 campuses is really a, a testament to a state of 5.2 million people, 13 uh, four-year campuses, 13 uh, two-year colleges, and uh, it provides, has provided both geographic access and economic access. And right now we're seeing a transition to uh, very, very high tuition increases every year. This year, Board of Regents, uh, last week, uh, uh, was a 7%. Uh, how many more of those can you indeed uh, expect uh, poor students to absorb without being priced out of the market, which then starts to take an historical pattern of this economic access to a great institution out of the picture. And, and with the, the uh, Pell Grants, which have long been, I think, as I understand it, a pretty substantial building block and or uh, the basis for poor kids going to college, uh, being substantially cut back sure. at the at the national level, um, I was interested in going back to school. Just why not? And checked into the price of a graduate one graduate course at the University of Wisconsin Milwaukee, which is a very good graduate school, is over sixteen hundred dollars. Um, is that per credit or for three for, credits? For three credits. For three credits. Yeah. For th mm -hmm. One three credit. I think in terms of of classes, sixteen hundred dollars. It's uh, that's a lot of money for one course, one three-credit course. Mm -hmm. And you know, we can all sit around and reminisce about you know, what it cost when we went to school, but uh, it, it's, it's pretty stunning. So I, I, and I, Tom, you're our Republican. Do you? <laughs> and a university person. And, and a university, university person. person. Yeah, I just feel the any... Republicans as having a real antipathy to, to the University oh, of Wisconsin to system. The contrary. To the contrary, I think they support the university system. I mean. I, uh, Doyle's budget last year decimated the university, mm -hmm. uh, and I think it was a split. And he was uh, chastised for not, you know, cutting enough. And then he proposes cutting it again this year. So mm -hmm. I don't know. I think it, it, the university is a big ticket item, and it everybody is. looks at it as a, some place it's going to survive. So we could take a little money, and they they're loaded with administration. So let's take some money away from it. But I don't think it, you could say it because the Republicans are in office. Why do they always think that of the university? I think we support the university. Uh, just like the Democrats say they support the university, but then, you know, mm. they Except take the money. the Democrats come up with more money for the university <laughs> their support for the well, university. Well, last year, uh, Doyle and, you know. So I think the university is, uh, uh, I always wonder, this is not a side story, I, I wonder if, uh, let's see, the former president, um, Catherine Lyle. Lyle, if she saw the writing on the wall or she just said, you know, it's time to move on, this is, uh, the university's being the, the target of all kinds of cuts and uh, maybe it's, uh, there's a cultural change here that's going on, it's time to move on. And well, I think there is a change. I mean, <laughs> there is a change. historically, Wisconsin provided itself for, with low tuition. And uh, that's not the case anymore. People yeah. are simply saying, let's compare ourselves to any number of institutions in the country and saying we're not uh, charging enough or equal to them. Let's get to that norm or above the norm. And that's the change in philosophy, okay. very much so. Wisconsin is now more or less in the middle of the Big Ten. Sure. The, as so far we used as to be about tuition. seven. Yeah, we used to be about seven. We kind of held time. that right. because we, again, had the access, uh, economic access. Uh, driving the, the, the uh -huh. train, but it isn't anymore. Right. One, of, one of the issues, too, I think, okay. was we used to get out-of-state uh, students, and that tuition was generally higher, which supported some of the 
some of the activities mm -hmm. in the teaching, but uh, mm -hmm. we still get that, but it's there's certainly a cap on that. Didn't they pass some sort of legislation to eliminate or to hold the line on how many out-of-state students? Uh, I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's astonishing to me just having had a child graduate from, from high school, how incredibly competitive um, the university system has become, Madison in particular, but I also understand lacrosse. <clears throat> very, very, very competitive uh, in terms of admissions where, you know, when we were um, graduating and going into the system, they took a lot of kids. Uh, you know, it just, it, it, mm -hmm. it was not, um, it was not that kind of competitive sort mm -hmm. of situation. Well, that's another reflection of, of starving the university. You can't mm -hmm. have the number of sections because you don't have the personnel no. right. to, to have them. So <coughs> right. eventually you're putting literally caps on the enrollment in your own public institution. Mm -hmm. And that's the question, of, again, of whether that's a good thing. Should all comers be able to uh, go to college and give the old college try and be hopefully better citizens and more economic, better economic producers, um, or do we put caps on simply because we don't mm -hmm. have enough money in the system? Well, those you indicated, the university system is large and really spread out through the state in, in, in a pretty effective way so that, I mean, if you can afford it, there's probably a two-year or a four-year campus somewhere fairly close to you that you can get into. But let me just segue into a matter that we had talked about, which is real complex and, and, and um, difficult to get your arms around completely. But one of the ways the University of Wisconsin, particularly in Madison, financially survives is through private grants, research grants, cool. truly one of the you know, foremost mm -hmm. research universities in the world. Um, Dr. Jamie Thompson, generally recognized as the, uh, the not the creator of stem cell research, but certainly one of its first pioneers, you know, heading up the effort in, in Wisconsin. We are a leader, the leader uh, from a university perspective in the United States on stem cell research. Proposal in our legislature to not ban stem cell research, but a bill that at least by some argument would have certainly a chilling effect on research capabilities within the, the university system. What do you think is gonna happen with that? Well, I would hope that uh, science would be a strong desire of our legislature because uh, not only is it a feather in our cap to have that research, it's for the betterment of mankind. Um, a recent Newsweek special on uh, health concerns had a whole section on stem cells and its relationship to cancer. Um, I think we need to be very careful in the legislative arena not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I mean, I, I don't think anybody's opposed to, uh, we don't want to clone and raise human beings to, to harvest organs and, and doing some type of atrocious thing, but uh, study of cells and their relationship to disease and, and growth and, and so on, I think is something that science needs to be listened to. And we ought to be very careful, in my opinion, about a legislature who simply has a knee-jerk reaction and says we can't spend money on this, we can't do this, uh, when in many cases the money that's coming into the university is private money. Exactly. Then, and when you talked about the university, we're, we're, I think we're number three in the nation in public universities in the amount of money we garner every year, and it's like three to four hundred million dollars to pay for research, which we all gain from, for better drugs, better health care, whatever it happens to be. We should take pride in the fact that that university is doing for the good work. It's doing good work for mankind. Our whole standard of living is affected by what comes out of our universities. And sometimes you get politicians who get on bandwagons and they do sometimes not have indeed all the facts and they do overreact. So I think my, my pitch here is that the legislature ought to sit down with our scientists that are, are doing good work and see where it is that uh, we ought to be in when you're talking about good science. Yeah. And it and it is it is so complex. Yes, it is. Uh, the the issues that people have, and we've been dealing with this for years and years of science and, and scientific progress outrunning our ethical structure that allows us to deal with with issues. Um, but I, 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 the money that comes into the university system for research, supports the university in so many respects that if that money begins to dry up. Um, again, you, kind of like a little mini or a major Florence County, you just start circling the drain, as we used to say, uh, and, and you, you get kind of sucked down, and it's kind of hard to pull out of it. 
Yes, sir. I haven't seen the bill, so I haven't. I mean, my issue was, and I think it's a moral issue for a lot of people, is the embryonic stem cell. But so stem cells, non-embryonic stem cells, I, you know, I, I agree. It's uh, continue. I mean, you have to respect uh, some of the moral issues that people have with embryonic stem cells. And you need to work around that or try to work with that. But uh, see, I haven't seen the bill, so I don't know what the bill is saying. Uh, <laughs> well, and it's, it's a broad bill that you know talks in terms of human cloning and in terms of complexity. We're talking about a, a, a wide range of, of issues, and, and, and it is complex stuff. I, don't, I certainly don't understand it all either. But I, I just worry about when you couple legislative cutbacks at the university with the action that might have a chilling effect on research money coming into the university. And the retention of personnel. Yeah, it's the perfect um, storm, yeah. and, and it's, it's, it's not a good thing, so. We had that whole issue not too long ago with salary increases for, for faculty uh, and whether we were keeping oh, up with yeah. other, other states. And uh, we weren't, and we were losing people to other states. And again, it reflects, again, the ability to garner uh, grants for research, and if you don't have the right shining stars there you're not going to get people looking to those people and give them the grants and, and so it just it really feeds on itself it's a, it's a systemic type of situation it really is yeah. and, and that's what i think the legislature has to be very careful about I th yeah we i think we'd ask them to sit down and carefully consider just where we stand as a state and all the issues that and, and, well that that's a whole <laughs> a whole different topic of conversation um, uh, we would be remiss if we didn't um, uh, touch on um, the death, uh, the passing of Gaylord mm -hmm. Nelson, the um, celebration of his life at the uh, Capitol yesterday. Any of you there? No. No. I, uh, I understand that there were up 4,000 people is what I heard. It's a lot of people to put in the rotunda. That's yeah. right. <laughs> it, uh, I'm sure they were kind of sticking out in this yeah, I think folks. five former governors and senators from all over the country. Mm -hmm. So it's a testament to, to the man and the job he did. And I think it's also a lesson to show how um, sometimes people vote about uh, how, what have you done for me lately because he was voted out of office by a person who was then voted out of office. <laughs> so, yeah. so, so and not much time at all. That's right. So it's <laughs> so. one of those things where uh, the legacy of Gaylord Nelson, I think, is now being appreciated for what it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, the man was a stellar uh, uh, person in the area of the environment and concern for the environment. And we got to thank him for the job he did as far as it's not just Earth Day. I mean, it's that's that's just the sort of the uh, the focal point for the public to to think about the the condition of the environment. But water standards and clean air standards and so on. He was involved very very integrally in the production of of that type of legislation throughout his career. Yeah, I remember uh, or the the um, comment that Obi uh, made yesterday that he was the best and sweetest man I ever knew. Mm -hmm. And I thought that that was just a, a, a pretty nice way of, of, um, of expressing it. I got to meet uh, uh, Senator Nelson uh, two years ago. He was made a fellow of the Wisconsin Academy of Sciences, Arts, and Letters. And uh, for many of his contributions to the state as well as to the nation and the world. And, uh, uh, he, was, and he would have been 87 at that point. And I was stunned by how um, smart he was and, <laughs> and, and how together and uh, uh, he had clearly his, his, he was functioning at a very high level mm -hmm. and he was extremely entertaining, gave a wonderful speech and uh, uh, it, those, it, you want to recognize somebody like that. Yeah. But, it, but it was an object lesson, I think. I remember when, when, when Nelson was beat, the thought was he wasn't paying attention to the folks back home. Uh, that's what I'd heard, you know, that he had mm -hmm. kind of, unlike Proxmire, who was always everywhere. Shaking hands. Yeah, shaking, shaking hands, hands everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Field again. Yeah. That, yeah. That, yeah. That, yeah. that Nelson uh, didn't make it home often enough. Yeah. And, and he would, I think he, the era started to change. I think he was mm -hmm. a cerebral politician who did a great deal of work on issues and I think the 32nd uh, commercial and political arena just wasn't him. Yeah. And when it, when it hit him, uh, I think he was just a new era of politics began, and he was very much a victim of it. Yeah, in particular, I, I, was, a little, I was a little younger, but, uh, <laughs> but I, I never sensed he mastered television mm -hmm. in particular. 
Um, whereas I thought Caspin ran, if I, as I watched that campaign, a pretty slick campaign. Yeah. And of course, um, you know, Caspin uh, rides in on Ronald Reagan's coattails as well. Yeah, a, number, that was a, a number of noted senators <clears throat> lost, Senator yeah. Church and yeah. others lost that, that same year. That right, Nelson exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, talking about more cerebral discussions, but I am interested just as we as we wrap up and segue from the environment to the most recent Supreme Court decision on the Oak Creek uh, power plant and We Energy's um, a decision to or ability now to go ahead and build um, 2.15 billion dollar coal uh, using plants in in Oak Creek. Um, so, you know, this has been an interesting um, long-term fought kind of thing, comes to a four to three uh, decision. Uh, the conservative branch of the court joined by uh, Lewis Butler, uh, who's typically in the more liberal uh, camp and also in Milwaukee, and all related to did the PSC, the Public Service Commission, exceed its authority in terms of um, allowing the plant in issuing these various permits. I, I, having had some minor involvement in a, in a power plant uh, myself, I, I, I just know that it's a real complex process. There are some allegations, and there always are, but that the PSC has become a pretty political body. Um, the dissent, the sharply worded dissent in this case, says that they didn't, uh, this PSC did not require all of the environmental studies that it should have and you know the statute is very clear about the you know 38,000 different things that you have to do in order to cite a power plant. Has the political process taken over do you think uh, um, that that the PSC is is more attuned to to industry interests or was it a fair decision? I think it's a, it's an accusation that's being made because there are a number of plants that are now being uh, granted permission to be built. Uh, wind farm out near Horicon Marsh is another very controversial one. And isn't that interesting? Because part of the power of the future piece is these you know two huge coal things, and then wind farms. Well, wind farms are kind of running into you know the feathers are hitting that fan and uh, or that windmill and and you know those nice you know politically correct wind farms are, are, they're just running into as much trouble. I mean, yeah. it's an interesting piece but, to me. But I, I think we're seeing uh, a public service commission that's probably observing the national scene of brownouts and blackouts and saying, uh, can we at this time be ogres or do we need to uh, build plants in order to keep up with economic and population growth? And I think environmentalists are saying they're not listening to mm -hmm. solar power and all the alternatives right. that could be implemented, uh, that they're not providing that leadership. Okay. They're simply reacting to requests to expand existing technology. And, and so, yeah. Out of I, time? I, get, get. The wind keeps, our wind keeps going, <laughs> Go but it's time to say Where's goodbye. <laughs> Thanks, and we'll see you again.